From Vermont Public, this is Brave Little State. I'm Josh Crane. From my home on the Vermont side of the Upper Valley, it's about a 40-minute drive to my destination in New Hampshire, a house in Plainfield on a mostly defunct dairy farm. So, what do you want to like set up? You want to be in the light, don't you? Yeah, I'm here on a recommendation. For the past few months, I've been working on a story all about the Upper Valley, a cross-border region that includes parts of far eastern Vermont and far western New Hampshire. It's a long way from the political and cultural centers of both states, so much so that it kind of feels like a third state in and of itself. When I was describing this story to one of my neighbors, he said, you got to talk to Steve Taylor, and that Steve's probably forgotten more about the Upper Valley than any of us will ever learn. My neighbor was right. Steve spends hours regaling me with tales from his long life in the region, all 85 years and counting as I sink ever deeper into the armchair in his living room. It was a 4-H project that went haywire for 10 bucks an acre when I was in high school. He became a great-grandfather. Congratulations. Well, yeah, pretty exciting. By the end of the interview, it's dark outside, and the wood stove is raging. I've burned through all my prepared questions, but I'm cozy. Steve is on a roll, and I don't want this conversation to end. Is anything else people should know about you? Oh, Jesus, I, I don't know. There's probably, <laughs> some probably stuff they don't want to know about me. I don't know. Hell no. I, I guess just diversity of interests is what I like. Oh, you don't want to hear this. What's this going on? <laughs> Hello? Hey. Uh, Josh is still here, and we're, we're, we're talking. You wouldn't believe what we've been talking about. He just asked me uh, the things that are... Uh, people should know about me. You, you got any suggestions? <laughs> <laughs> okay, say that again because I, I missed it. What? Say that again. You're very good at getting things done behind the scenes. And your years of being a selectman, you know, helped you to be almost the unofficial mayor of Plainfield. <laughs> Jesus. All right. All right. Do you want me to go on? No, no, stop right there. That's enough of that. <laughs> all right. It's funny. Okay, we'll hit the movies on Thursday, all right? Sounds good. All, all right. Take Bye. care. <laughs> Who's that? Uh, her name is Rosemary Mills. Uh, oh, <laughs> we date a lot. Like, yeah, she's right nearby. Uh, Rosemary's assessment of Steve as the unofficial mayor of Plainfield sounds about right. He's a lifelong resident. He spent more than 30 years as the town moderator and he worked in local newspapers. He also did a long stint as a statewide official, New Hampshire's Commissioner of Agriculture. I was an outside-the-box candidate. Outside-the-box because Steve is more dairy farmer than politician. He's long retired now, and his dairy operation, Taylor Farm, shut down a handful of years ago. The worsening economics for small dairies forced his family's hand. To see the cows go and... 2018 broke my heart, but uh, it's the way it is. In retirement, Steve has become a sort of de facto historian of the Upper Valley. So here are some basics. The Upper Valley describes a stretch of the Connecticut River spanning about 50 miles, depending on who you ask, and the cluster of Vermont and New Hampshire towns on either side. The exact edges of the region are a little fuzzy, but there's no debate that its middle includes Norwich and Hartford in Vermont and Lebanon and Hanover in New Hampshire. There are no big mountains here. The greens and whites are distant peaks to the west and east, respectively. But there are a lot of winding roads and hills. This basically uh, is on the northeast end of the Appalachians. And by rights, it should be an Appalachian economy. It would be a hard scrabble place. Small farms, forestry, rural communities, that's certainly all present in the Upper Valley. It's a pretty remote area. In spite of this, the Upper Valley has a dash of the cosmopolitan. It's home to advanced engineering companies, historic opera houses, and art museums. Also, public media organizations like the brave little state mothership Vermont Public. We have an Upper Valley studio in Norwich, 
in the headquarters for the King Arthur Baking Company. My neighbor down here, he's a tech executive. The guy, he starts these tech companies, he sells them for a zillion dollars, and goes and starts another one. And, uh, you know, right down there. And then right over here, is the guy's a house painter, and she does home health care. The next house up, that guy is a neurologist, and his wife is a music teacher. Next house up, the guy's a banker. And, I mean, it just goes on and on. There are just all this diversity. And uh, I still have a soft spot for uh, people who have farmed or who have worked with their hands. Uh, I like to talk with a guy who can run a backhoe. I asked Steve why this is, why all these people and institutions ended up in this remote area, far from Burlington and Montpelier, Concord and Manchester. He says it's simple. Here, plunked down, are two multi-billion dollar operations, Dartmouth College and the medical center. Dartmouth College, the Ivy League institution, and Dartmouth Health, one of the major medical systems of northern New England. He also highlights all the transportation options in the area. Interstates 89 and 91 reached the Upper Valley in the 1960s and 70s, which paved the way for strip malls with big box stores. Amtrak stops here. And you can even fly from the Upper Valley to New York or Boston via the Lebanon Municipal Airport. For many of those who live here, the Upper Valley has everything. I think that there are a significant number of people in the Upper Valley who identify more as residents of the Upper Valley, more so than as residents of Vermont or New Hampshire. This is David Watts, the winning question asker for this episode. He lives in Norwich and works across the river in Lebanon at a hospital affiliated with Dartmouth. He's also on the board of directors of a nonprofit called Vital Communities. The org operates as a convener across state lines, bringing together Upper Valley communities on either side of the Connecticut to address common issues like housing shortages and climate change. That type of collaboration between Vermont and New Hampshire might sound odd. The states are sort of rivals. I mean, Brave Little State made a whole episode about it. You can even get a sense just from the two state mottos. Vermont, freedom and unity. New Hampshire, live free or die. In the Upper Valley, there's an air of cooperation. Live free and unity, or something like that. The river here feels less like a political and cultural border and more like the beating heart of Upper Valley life. I live and work here, and sometimes I find myself crisscrossing it three, four, five times a day, running errands, going for hikes, visiting friends. I just think that that creates a unique identity for the people who live here. And also a unique identity for a lot of area businesses. I did a quick unscientific experiment to get a sense of this. I opened Google Maps on my phone, hovered over the general geographic area of the region, and searched for the phrase Upper Valley. Almost 150 companies, nonprofits, groups, centers, and services popped up all bearing the phrase Upper Valley in their official name. This regional identity is a point of pride for David. But in the larger story of Vermont and New Hampshire, and maybe even New England, he thinks the Upper Valley gets a little bit overlooked, or possibly even taken for granted. If you don't live here, you're more likely to pass through on your way to somewhere else. There are no big ski resorts in the immediate vicinity. And other than Woodstock, which calls itself America's prettiest town, and Hanover, where Dartmouth is, there aren't really any major tourist draws. I don't know if people beyond the Upper Valley know what the Upper Valley is. It's ill-defined. Ill-defined is part of the problem, because the first step to appreciating something is understanding it. And even amongst those who live in the Upper Valley, there isn't a clear consensus about some pretty basic things. Like, exactly how big is it? Where does it end? And also, why is it called the Upper Valley? Um, I don't know if the Upper Valley is defined by geography or economics or a state of mind. David's hoping Brave Little State can clarify some things. And lots of you do too, since his question won in a public voting round to decide the focus of this episode. His question goes like this. What is the Upper Valley and how did it get its name? 
preface anything uh, with this. Upper Valley is a preposterous term. Brave Little State is a production of Vermont Public and a proud member of the NPR Network. Welcome. Brave Little State is supported by Vermont Fish and Wildlife, working to restore Vermont's threatened and endangered species through the Non-Game Wildlife Fund on the Vermont Income Tax Return. And Common Ground Center in Starksboro, a nonprofit offering event space and lodging for retreats, meetings, and celebrations. Learn more about their gathering spaces and programs at cgcvt.org. Uh, now we get to the term Upper Valley. Back to the unofficial mayor of Plainfield, New Hampshire, Steve Taylor. The uh, term begins with a newspaper war. A good old-fashioned newspaper war. On one side, the Claremont Daily Eagle. Headquartered in Claremont, New Hampshire, it served the area from Bellows Falls, Vermont, and Charlestown, New Hampshire in the south, up to Bradford, Vermont, and Orford, New Hampshire in the north. A group of towns that were all colonized around the same time. So it was a pretty good-sized territory that they, they functioned on. Uh, McLean Clark was a, a great newspaper man. John McLean Clark was an accomplished national journalist and Dartmouth College alum, which is why he bought the nearby Claremont Daily Eagle in 1948 to return to his old stomping grounds. He put together a tremendous news team, and they put out a fine newspaper. Uh, Very sadly, in 1950, there was a, a flood in the Claremont area. The Sugar River went wild. And John Clark and two of his kids went out in a canoe uh, kind of for the hell of it. John McLean Clark never made it home. So in November 1950, his widow was uh, had this newspaper dumped in her lap, and she had five kids to raise. Uh, it was a tremendous uh, undertaking, and she struggled, and uh, she she stayed with it. Right around this time, two other Ivy League grads enter the scene. Two young whippersnapper. Uh, One graduated from Dartmouth, one graduated from Harvard. Alan Butler and Jim Farley. They had their Ivy League pedigrees, and um, they they were aspiring newspaper guys. Well, they could see that Mrs. Clark was struggling to, to run the paper, and they thought it was going downhill. So they helped her. Of course they did, right? No, they did not. So they got came up with the idea, let's go start our own newspaper. Alan and Jim went to Lebanon, New Hampshire, about 20 miles north of Claremont, and rented space in an old car dealership. They acquired a printing press, and they signed on with the Associated Press Wire Service. All that was missing was a name and a defined coverage area. Well, first they said, well, we'll call it the Tri-Towns, meaning White River Junction, Lebanon, and Hanover. Well, that didn't really do it. Uh, And then they thought, well, the Eagle, back in Claremont, had always called their territory the Twin State Valley. So they said, "Uh, uh aha, we'll call the territory we're going to carve out out of their territory, we're going to call it the Upper Valley. The Valley News was born. So, but what ensued then was a newspaper war between the, the Eagle of the Twin State Valley and the Valley News of the Upper Valley. It was a war over territory, and it was also a war over the character of the region. The Eagle was operated by Rhoda Shaw Clark, a widow raising five kids and it was based in Claremont, an old mill town. On the other side, the Valley News was geographically and culturally more closely aligned with Dartmouth College, and they had a noticeably more progressive editorial page. According to Steve, some probably viewed the phrase Upper Valley as an elitist dig at the working-class paper down the river. What it connotes to them is people in Hanover and Lebanon look down their nose at Claremont, a, a tough old industrial town. This war went on for about five years. Competition was fierce. But at the end of 1960, the Claremont Daily Eagle waved the white flag, so to speak. They were losing too much money, 
and decided to stop selling papers in Lebanon, one of their biggest markets. It wasn't really about the quality of the journalism. There were larger economic forces at play. Claremont's heyday was in the past. Hanover and Lebanon, home of the Valley News, were gaining prominence. Dartmouth College was rising to become a national institution. And then, of course, the medical center, that, that was beginning to grow. The Valley News rode the economic wave. They started to turn a profit, momentum that continued in 1965 under the purview of their new news director, a young man by the name of Steve Taylor. So that's what I did for just under eight years. Great experience, and uh, we were catching the wave, really, a tsunami of the interstate highways being completed, and that attracted all kinds of activity. The Valley News won the newspaper war, and their regional moniker also won out. Pretty soon, you noticed in the phone books, there might be eight or nine Upper Valley listings for businesses and not for profits, calling themselves the Upper Valley this, the Upper Valley that. And that, that has happened over the, over the last 50-some-odd years. It keeps growing. There are a handful of businesses that play off the name Twin State car dealerships, plumbing companies, and the like. But here's the real difference. I've never met anyone who would say they live in the Twin State region. No, they live in the Upper Valley. Today, the phrase newspaper of the Upper Valley dons the top corner of every Valley News front page. Green Valley News mailboxes are ubiquitous on residential roads around the region. They did make some recent cuts, but they're still delivering local and national news six days a week. Meanwhile, the Claremont Daily Eagle morphed into the Claremont Eagle Times. It briefly shut down in 2009 before being purchased by a Pennsylvania-based news group. As of 2022, it's operating under new local ownership. Their website still states proudly, serving the Twin State Valley. At some point during my conversation with Steve Taylor, one of his sons walks in. He and his wife operate a smokehouse across the road. Yes, Bill? No, no, this is Josh Crane from Vermont. Vermont Public Radio, damn it. Anyway, so we're talking about Upper Valley, where that stupid term came from. Oh. Mm -hmm. What are you doing? I was just checking your wood supply. Yeah, good. I think you got enough. All right tonight? Yeah, I'm good. Yep. All right. See you soon. Upper Valley, this phrase, you called it a stupid phrase. Well, if I mean, if you, you look at it hard, I mean, you're, you're trying to say it's as high as you can be, but you're not. If it's upper, it should take in Coas County and, and uh, Essex County and Caledonia and all that country. That, that's the Upper Valley. I mean, <laughs> so we're, I guess, more technically like the Middle Valley. Yeah, but in, in proportion to the whole length of the river, you've got all of Connecticut and you've got all of Mass. So we're probably you know, 60%. Upper so, middle valley. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I think you got, you've got it. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, upper valley is not a geographically accurate phrase. But in the 70-some years after those Ivy League upstarts first established the Valley News, it's come to mean a lot more than a newspaper circulation area. Um, Both individuals and institutions refer to themselves as being located in the Upper Valley. This is Garrett Uh, Dash Nelson. I track him down at a work retreat. Garrett's the president of the Leventhal Map and Education Center at the Boston Public Library. He's a regional expert. As in, he spent much of his scholarly career thinking about the concept of a region. Unlike a state or a municipality, you don't pay taxes to your region. You don't vote necessarily in a regional government. He says regions are based more on the natural landscape or culture than any political borders. Take the Midwest or Eastern Europe. You probably have a general idea of where these regions are located, though probably not these specific borders. All these sort of uh, slightly hazily defined geographic terms, which you know are pointing at real units on the map, but, but are also 
very much determined, sometimes overdetermined by, by a sense of like cultural connection. Garrett says we're constantly defining the places we live and the places other people live and making sense of ourselves based on that map. Sometimes our geographic identities do correspond to political boundaries, like maybe you're someone who strongly identifies with being a Vermonter or a New Hampshireite. But often the places we identify with are more vague. The Northeast Kingdom, the seacoast, Western Mass, the Upper Valley. We're making up these imagined territories all the time and assigning characteristics to them. Earlier in his career, Garrett did a postdoc at Dartmouth College. He was already interested in studying how regional definitions evolve over time. And so when he moved to the Upper Valley, he kind of accidentally hit the geography jackpot. And he had much of the same curiosity as David Watts, today's winning question asker. So I started looking into it, right? Like, what, what, what exactly do we mean? What, what, what is this region? What, what's in and what's out? Garrett devised an experiment. The first thing he did was ask people to look at a map of the larger area and then draw their boundaries for the upper valley onto that map. After collecting 150 of these, he aggregated all the responses together. You can see the finished product on our website, bravelittlestate.org. It's basically a cluster of dots, each dot representing one town that showed up on the user-drawn maps. Darker red dots symbolize towns with more consensus, and fainter red dots are the more unusual inclusions. Really the only kind of consensus was that the four core towns of Norwich, Hanover, Lebanon, Hartford were definitely in the Upper Valley. Those are the darkest red dots on the map, right in the center of the region. Every concentric circle out from that is like a little, little less agreement about whether you're in or out. When we come back... What is the Upper Valley? I don't know. It would be the Lower Upper Valley. Yeah. The lower, in the Lower Upper Valley. <laughs> we try and find a regional border. That's coming up next. Thanks for listening to Brave Little State, where we have support from the Vermont Department of Liquor and Lottery, who manages Vermont's 802 Spirits liquor stores. Contributing 100% of profits to the general fund, providing over $300 million to help benefit local communities. The Upper Valley, as a geographic area, is ill-defined. The Valley News includes 46 towns in its circulation area. Vital Communities, the Upper Valley nonprofit, includes 69 towns in its service area. And if we go off of the only area of consensus from Garrett-Nelson's geography experiment, the Upper Valley includes just four towns, Hanover and Lebanon on the New Hampshire side, and Norwich and Hartford on the Vermont side. We, over at Brave Little State, decided to test the region's borders out for ourselves. And by we... Hello, hello, associate producer Burgess Brown. Hey, Josh. Last week, you and I ventured out to opposite ends of the Upper Valley or at least what we thought those ends might be. Yeah, we went off of the service map for vital communities, which casts the widest net in terms of the size of the Upper Valley. That's right. We basically tackled either end of a 90-mile stretch of the Connecticut River. I snaked my way across the northern edge on the Vermont side. And I took the southern portion. All right, Burgess, let's start with you. What did you find on your geographical definition expedition? So I started off in South Rygate, a small village in Caledonia County that straddles the Wells River. I drove a few laps of town before I could find signs of life. Hi. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm doing okay. What can I help you with? Uh, I stopped in the South Rygate post office to talk with Cindy behind the counter. She agreed to chat with me after I assured her there wouldn't be any tough questions. So my first question is really easy is, are we in the Upper Valley right now? Uh, I consider myself Upper Valley. You do? Yeah. Yeah, I think we'd have to be the Upper Valley. What's the hesitation? Well, because Lebanon considers to be when you see the newspaper or something, it's Upper Valley. But we're in the whole valley. So yeah. this, so you'd say this is maybe the outskirts of, of Upper Probably, Valley? Probably, yeah. yeah. Okay. Next, I set a course for Gramps Country Store in West Topsom. 
Becca and Kaylee were working the register, and they were even less confident of Upper Valley geography than Cindy was. I guess that's a really good question. I guess I'm puzzled about it, too. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, are, okay, are we in the Upper Valley now? Do you consider this the Upper Valley? Yes. <laughs> I think so. Then Anne, a customer, walked in and shared a very confident take. This is stupid because the Upper Valley is lower. Lower than any other valley in the whole state. Isn't that stupid? Wouldn't Upper Valley be like Claremont, Springfield, kind of in that area? It's, the Upper Valley is the Northeast Kingdom. That's where it should be, but it's not. I always have wondered who named it that. It was obviously somebody who didn't live here. Well, Burgess, it sounds like we had a pretty similar experience. I started my afternoon in Westminster, a farming community in Wyndham County, Vermont. Hi there. Can I ask you a question? I intercepted longtime resident Elma Beals outside the town offices. Very simple question for you. Are we in the Upper Valley? Yes. So how far does the Upper Valley <laughs> go to? I really don't know. Linda Fawcett, librarian at Westminster's Butterfield Library, had a different answer. No. No, we're in southern Vermont. I traveled over to the New Hampshire side and inched a bit further north to Claremont. That's where I ran into a woman parked on Pleasant Street near the offices of the Claremont Eagle Times. She beckoned me over to the driver's side window of her well-loved 95 Corolla, curious about my recording equipment. Making a radio story. You want to be in it? What's it about? Um, I'm going around asking people if we're in the Upper Valley. Oh. This is Athena like, Brio. She works for the Addiction yeah. Recovery Center across the street. What do you think? Kinda. We're in the Connecticut River Valley. Where, what, what is the Upper Valley? I would say Lebanon, Hanover. I don't know. Would be the lower Upper Valley. The lower in the lower Upper Valley. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. It's not quite the Upper Valley. We're close. We're close. You can get there in 20 minutes. What do you think is the reputation of the Upper Valley? Um, expensive, like, like you know, turn up your nose, upper. <laughs> oh, yeah, like upper in, in the other. Yes, in the area. other sense. Like, you go to Hanover, and I, I drove this car in Hanover, and I was like, oh, my goodness. You know, it's just a whole different vibe because the college is right up there, you know, like. After gallivanting around the outer edges of the Upper Valley, I returned to geographer Garrett Dash Nelson's mapping experiment, the one with all the user-drawn borders of the Upper Valley. In addition to asking people to draw borders, he also asked people to submit a written explanation of why they drew the borders where they did. Quite a few responses referring to the sort of snobbiness of the Upper Valley or it, sort of it's like, a, you know, seeing it as a more kind of elite region, probably driven by the presence of Dartmouth uh, or, you know, a handful of relatively wealthy municipalities that are at the core of that area. Some people talked about the term deriving back to the circulation area of the Valley News. Culture. History. Class. It's all there in how Garrett's respondents imagine this place. And it matches a lot of the responses Burgess and I got out in the field. The Upper Valley is a vibe, a sensibility. And what exactly that vibe or sensibility is depends on who exactly you are. Meanwhile, Garrett says people's relationships to the places they live have changed a lot since the beginning of the pandemic. And in this case... That might mean more people identifying with the concept of the Upper Valley than ever before. As we've become formally despatialized in certain ways, we've also come to, like, prize or crave this sense of regional attachment. Perhaps leaning into the Upper Valley identity is a way to reclaim something we've lost, or emphasize something we previously took for granted. Up to this point, we've been discussing the Upper Valley as a region. But imagine for a minute that the Upper Valley is actually one large city. And all the small towns in the area are different neighborhoods of that city. 
If you think about how you live in a city, you don't just stick to your neighborhood. Rob Gerwitt has lived in the Upper Valley for 25 years. Every weekday morning, he publishes a newsletter called Daybreak, featuring key news items from around the region, which means he thinks a lot about what the Upper Valley is and where it is. And this region as a city thing is his idea. He says it's one of the best ways to really understand this place. You go from neighborhood to neighborhood, depending on whether you're going to a particular restaurant you want to eat at, or there's a store across town that you want to go to, or there's a music venue on the far side of the city that you want to see. I mean, that's, that's how the Upper Valley works. To back this up, Rob points to the idea of micropolitan areas. Micropolitan as opposed to metropolitan. Whereas metropolitan areas are mostly urban and suburban, micropolitan describes a cohesive cluster of smaller cities and towns that operate like a rural ecosystem, away from the gravitational pull of a major urban center. The U.S. Census Bureau follows more than 500 of these micropolitan areas around the United States. As a whole, they account for about 14 percent of the national population. One of them's labeled the Lebanon, New Hampshire, Vermont micro area, basically the Upper Valley. And here's the detail that really brought it all home for me. According to the data, this is the most populous micropolitan area in the entire country, with a population of well over 200,000 people. <laughs> The caveat here is that the census definition of the Upper Valley is the broadest I've seen. Still, that's more people than live in all of Chittenden County, but without a population center like Burlington, meaning the hundreds of thousands of people in this region really are spread out across a series of small towns, each one like a separate neighborhood. You might call White River Junction the theater and arts district, Lebanon the shopping district, Hanover, the college district, and so on and so forth. If you've ever struggled to understand the Upper Valley and the whole remote cosmopolitan thing, this information is your validation. Nationally speaking, the Upper Valley is truly a geographic and cultural outlier. But what that also means is that you kind of wish more people knew about just so we could share it. I mean, there's There are lots of really good restaurants, and there's lots of really good uh, art and performing arts, and there's um, lots of really interesting people, and there are really excellent bookstores. But the political and media attention uh, in both states is elsewhere. It's up in the Burlington area or or Montpelier in Vermont, and it's really over in Concord and Manchester and the seacoast and and the southern tier in New Hampshire. All this means that in lots of ways, the Upper Valley has to rely on itself to make its own fun. The Upper Valley, making its own fun since 1952. Maybe we just need a slogan. 1952, by the way, is the year the Valley News first started circulating. Thanks for listening to the show. And thanks to David Watts of Norwich for the great question. For photos from my reporting and lots more about the Upper Valley, check out the web version of this story. There's a link in the show notes, or just go to bravelittlestate.org. While you're there, you can sign up for our free newsletter and ask a question about Vermont, our region, or its people that you want us to explore in a future episode. We're also on Instagram and Reddit at BraveStateVT. This episode was reported by me, Josh Crane. Editing and additional production from Sabine Pooks and Burgess Brown. Angela Evansy is Brave Little State's executive producer. Our theme music is by Ty Gibbons. Other music by Blue Dot Sessions. Special thanks to Sophie Stevens, Mark Davis, Bill Kane, Pat Borum, John Lowe, Richard Hastings, and Kat Blanchard. Brave Little State is a production of Vermont Public and a proud member of the NPR Network. If you like our show, you can make a gift at bravelittlestate.org slash donate, or just leave us a rating and review on your favorite podcast app. We'll be back soon with more people-powered Vermont journalism. 
Thanks for listening. Vermont may be our brave little state, but there are some big stories out there. I'm Mitch Wortley, but I host The Frequency, the daily news podcast from Vermont Public. Every weekday as you get out the door, we'll get you up to speed on Vermont news in about 15 minutes. Subscribe to The Frequency wherever you get your podcasts. A proud member of the NPR Network.